This morning, uh, if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 5, we're going to start at verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now, even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to the desolate places and pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and led him down with his bed through the tiles in the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you that you are God over all our storms and our illnesses and weaknesses. We are surprised by the sudden changes that are happening all around us, but you are not. You are not surprised, and you are not frightened or overwhelmed or panicked in the least. We pray, Lord, give us your vision and power and love to serve you and glorify you. Amen. I want to talk about three things this morning. First, ask Jesus for anything. And second, expect more than you came for. And third, get ready to act. Imagine being this leper. Leprosy is a horrible disease that can make people blind and unable to feel pain. Often the skin starts to look like thick scales, which is why it's called leprosy from the Greek word that means scales. And people, uh, because people with leprosy can't feel when they get hurt, their hands and feet and face and whole bodies can become seriously deformed. If you got leprosy in the ancient world, it not only meant that you would suffer the incredible pain of the disease, but it also meant that you'd lose all your friends and family. You were a real, no kidding, outcast. Your friends and family couldn't touch you. They didn't want to get anywhere near you because they thought they might get leprosy. You couldn't work, so you lived in abject poverty, rotting away with other lepers in exactly the same condition. The only way out was to die. The next step was always down. In Luke 5, this guy with leprosy heard about Jesus and about how Jesus was going around healing people. He did not hear that he did not hear anyone talk about how Jesus had taken away leprosy because he hadn't done that yet. He'd heard about Jesus taking away demons and sickness, but demons and sickness were things that went away sometimes. Leprosy did not go away. And Luke says this man was full of leprosy. He was not a mild case. He had already been deformed by it. He might have lost fingers or even scratched off part of his face. He probably looked and smelled like death. But he wasn't defined by it. He thought, if Jesus can do the things that I have heard of, then he can certainly do this. There's almost no way 
he'd actually seen a single one of Jesus' miracles because he was a true outcast. If there was a crowd, he was not in it. People avoided him like the plague. This is why he had to go find Jesus when no one else was around. But this man knew that Jesus could do it. So he knew he had to find him. He didn't wait until he heard about other lepers who got cleansed by Jesus. He didn't listen to the doctors who said, you'll never get better. He didn't listen to the crowds who said, you're an outcast, you're barely human, and you shouldn't even go near anyone who's really human. He wasn't defined by the negative thinking of the other lepers either, who said, all we are is lepers. It's all we'll ever be. Instead, he said, I am a child of God. I am loved by God. And I know that God lives strong in Jesus. So I'm going to find him and I'm going to ask for the unthinkable. You can ask Jesus for the unthinkable. Sometimes people wonder why God isn't answering their prayers and they start to lose faith. But James says, you have not because you ask not. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. I can picture the other lepers saying, God, just make me, uh, give me a little less leprosy. I know this is going to kill me, but just slow it down a little bit. But this man said, I'm going all the way. I'm going to find Jesus. I'm going to ask him for a total cleansing. I'm going to say, Lord, take it all away. He said, I know God is all powerful and I'm going to ask him for something that only an all powerful God can do. Are you asking God for things like that? Or are you praying depressed prayers? Don't think about what you're capable of doing. Look at what your God is capable of. You think that God, the God who created the universe can be stopped by leprosy? You think that he can be thwarted by disease? Your God can change the spots of a leopard. Your God can split open the ocean so you can walk through it, or if he chooses, he can make you walk right on the top of it. He has thousands upon thousands of angels at his command, and he is ready to send them to your side whenever you call upon him. But he wants to be glorified in it. He doesn't like to just do things that you could do on your own. He likes to do the impossible, the unthinkable. He likes to take stage four cancer and erase it. He likes to take hearts that are totally weak and messed up and make them strong so that he can send people out to share his mission with the world. Our God likes something that takes a real challenge, seems like a real challenge for us. Think about it like this. When a kid is three, Tying his shoe is a challenge. It makes sense when a three-year-old says, Daddy, can you help me tie my shoe? But if you can imagine your 23-year-old says, can you help me tie my shoe? A lot of times that's what God is looking at us and seeing. A lot of times that's how we're asking him. We're saying, Lord, can I just have a little bit of help with something that I can really do on my own? Don't be surprised when you don't hear anything in response. God is saying, tie your own shoes, then come back and ask me for something real. This leper asked Jesus for something real. He wasn't a little bit leprous. He was full of leprosy. He had to find Jesus when he was all alone, which was no small feat in and of itself. And when he did, the man fell on his face and said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. I know you can do it, God. This is the kind of prayer that Jesus wants. Don't say, God, just make me a little less depressed. Say, God, you can take away this depression. Don't say, Lord, please take away my addiction a little bit. Say, Lord, remove this addiction from me. Don't say, Lord, take away a little bit of my guilt. Say, take my sins to the other side of the world and throw them in the sea, Lord. I need you to do this. Just because you come from a long line of depressed people or addicted people or people who have the same illness, that's not too big for God. You're actually in the perfect spot for him to show how much he can do. He can take someone who's inherited depression, addictions, relationship problems, bad temper, chronic illness, whatever it is, and say, 
it ends today. That's what he did with this leper. He said, I will be clean. And look at the tenderness of this. He didn't just say the word. He could have just said the word and made it happen. But in verse 13, he reached out his hand and touched the man. This man has not been touched in years. If you go to a nursing home, give someone a big hug because nobody touches people who are elderly and sick, but they crave it. I think this every time I get sick, I think, oh, if I could just get a hug from Megan, <laughs> but then she might get sick. But when you're untouchable, that's what you want. You want touch. When you're unlovely, that's when you want love the most. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I love you. I look past those things. I will reach right into your world and make you clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Now, expect more than you came for. You might not get exactly what you asked for. Thank goodness God doesn't give us everything we ask for. In 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul talks about a problem that tormented him. He doesn't say exactly what it was, but he calls it a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Notice that he didn't pray, Lord, make it go away just a little bit. He said, Lord Jesus, get rid of it. He expected an answer, and he got one. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul discovered that the purpose of that problem in his life was to teach him something. And he learned it well. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. So that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Jesus didn't take away Paul's thorn, but he taught him to boast all the more in his weakness so that more of Christ's power could rest on him. You see, his weakness made him a conduit of Jesus' power. The paralyzed man in our passage didn't get what he was looking for at first either. Picture this scene for a second. It's a house full of people. It's packed. Jesus is teaching. Some friends have coordinate, coordinated their schedules to pick up their paralyzed friend and go find Jesus for a healing. He's easy enough to find because he's the center of a big crowd. The problem is that Jesus is not easy to get to because Today, he's inside a packed house. But these friends refused to take no for an answer. Most houses in Israel back then had two stories. The top one was basically a roof with walls around it. You could walk up to it by stairs on the side of the house. Picture a roof made of clay or mud laid on top of a series of wooden poles for support. The friends decide to go up to the roof of the house and dig straight through to get to Jesus. This was not an extremely neat operation. At first, Jesus and the people below might have been able to ignore the sounds of feet above them, the sounds of digging at the ceiling, but the friends soon got enough clay off the roof so that light poured down into the room along with dust and dirt and everything else. At that point, I imagine a lot of people started coughing. Some people yelled at the guys above them. And the ones directly below cleared the way so uh, the best they could. But everyone watched this whole thing in amazement. Once the hole was big enough, the, digger, the diggers had to figure out a way to lower their paralyzed friend on the bed through the slats without dropping him. They executed the whole thing so perfectly, though, that in Luke 5.19, it says they got him down right in the middle of the crowd before Jesus. So this was his big moment of truth. He and his friends knew that Jesus could help him. They were so sure of it that they made themselves into very unwelcome guests for some unlucky homeowner. Now, what was Jesus going to do? Most people would probably say this is not really the time or place for this. In fact, there were extra mitigating circumstances to, th to make you think that this was a particularly bad time and place for all this to happen. The reason the house was so packed with people 
was because a lot of new people had come to check Jesus out. Verse 17 says, Pharisees and teachers of the law had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. The fact that they came in all the way from Judea and Jerusalem means a lot of things. It means Jesus is not just a regional phenomenon anymore. He's attracting national attention. But in those days, all things religious flowed to Jerusalem. That was where things got inspected, checked out, approved, or not approved by leaders. Here, we've got the leaders from Jerusalem moving out to Galilee, which meant something fishy was going on in Galilee and needed to be checked out. This is a pretty high-stakes meeting for Jesus. But Luke 5, verse 17 also says, The power of the Lord was with him to heal. This is a very interesting detail because we know that a room full of skeptical people is not normally a great place of healing power. Mark chapter 6, verse 5 says this was a big problem in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. It says Jesus could not do any mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled at their unbelief. In other words, when people don't expect that God can do much, he tends not to do much. On the other hand, we also know that God takes particular delight in publicly shaming powerful, skeptical people. This is what happened in Egypt with Pharaoh. In the early chapters of Exodus, Moses kept saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh kept not letting Israel go. And the Lord kept sending plagues on Pharaoh and Egypt and really destroying the whole country. But Pharaoh was absolutely incensed by the idea that the God of these slave people, the Hebrews, would have power over him. Pharaoh was the greatest emperor over the greatest nation in the world. He even thought of himself as a god. What business did this Yahweh have telling Pharaoh what to do? When it was all said and done, God sent ten plagues on Egypt. But at some point, it became absolutely ridiculous to watch this inferior Pharaoh try to stand up to Yahweh. Right before the Lord sent the seventh plague, he said to Pharaoh in Exodus 9, verse 16, I want you to know that I raised you up for this very purpose, to show you my power so that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So even though Pharaoh's skepticism kept him from seeing the Lord as the true God and kept him from receiving the blessings of the Lord, God saw it as the perfect time to act and show his power. This is a deep principle in scripture, and Paul puts it like this in 1 Corinthians 1. God chose what is foolish in the world in order to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This is why a room full of skeptical Pharisees is actually bursting with healing power. It's why when you walk into a situation that looks absolutely grim, you can know that it is heavy with power from the Lord. It's why even right now, when you walk into the grocery store where half the people are in a frenzy to buy everything and the other half are loudly verbalizing their annoyance at the frenzy, this is not the time to buy into the panic. It's the time to pray, God, come to this place. Give grace. Make me an agent of your peace because it's bursting with God's power. It's why you can be sure that right now in the panic over COVID-19, the world is heavy with the healing power of the Lord because he loves to show his power, his mercy, and his love in the midst of the forces of chaos. Now, at first, the paralyzed man did not get what he wanted. Luke 5.20, when Jesus saw the faith of this man's friends, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. This is not what the man came for, but it's so good. It's like the healing touch that the leper got right before Jesus pronounced him clean. Notice that 
Luke did not say the power of the Lord was with Jesus to forgive. He said the power of the Lord was with him to heal. But where there is healing, there is forgiveness. And where there is forgiveness, there is healing. When Jesus forgave him, that's when he really irritated the scribes and Pharisees. It was just what they were worried about, that there was something off about Jesus and his teaching and what he was doing. So they started talking about it and saying, who is this guy? Only God can forgive sins, which is really exactly what Jesus would ho- was hoping would happen. Basically, they set up a test for him. And it was like this. If you're going to claim that you can do what only God can do with forgiveness, then you need to prove that you can do what he can do in other ways too. So Jesus took the test. He said, just so that you can know that I have power over sin, I will now demonstrate my divine authority over paralysis. And he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Notice how he says it. He said, I say to you, rise. Not in the name of the Lord, rise, but in my name, rise. When you and I ask for healing from the Lord, it is always in the name of the Lord. That's how Jesus would have it, because it's his name that has the power, not mine, not yours, so that in everything he might be glorified. That's how people did it back then, too. Priests would forgive in the name of the Lord and bless in the name of the Lord. Everything was in the name of the Lord, as it should be. Jesus isn't saying the words, I am the Lord, but he, and he's very careful not to say that, but he's making it extremely clear that it's true by his actions. That's the test he's taking, and it's the test he's passing in this passage. Now let's talk about get ready to act. Notice what he told the man to do. He said, you rise, you pick up your bed, you go home. When God acts in your life, he makes you part of the healing process. If you're Moses, you have to actually go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. That's when you get to see God work in marvelous ways. If you're the man with leprosy, you have to go to the priest and offer the sacrifices for cleansing. If you're the paralyzed man, you have to actually just get up and walk. Jesus is saying to the man, I have already put the power in you. Now you have to use it. It's like the three-year-old coming to Jesus for a shoe tying, and Jesus says, I have given you the power to do it, now do it. The key is this. Jesus is very generous with power. He's generous with mercy, love, forgiveness, miracles. He does them all the time. But he's going to make you part of the healing too. If you're praying, God, help my family get it together, he will do it. And he's going to make you part of the healing. If you're praying, Lord, help me find another job, he will help you. And you're going to have to be part of it. If you're praying, Lord, help me be an agent of grace and love when everyone I know is panicking, he is definitely ready to help you do that. He has more than enough love and strength in his storehouses to overflow his spirit in your heart with peace. And you need to be part of it, too. You need to get up, take your mattress, and walk. Now, this paralyzed man has been attached to his mattress for a long time. It's supported him. It's the only thing between him and the ground. Jesus is saying, you're not dependent on it any longer. You're not dependent on the anger that gives you a sense of control and causes problems in your marriage. You're not dependent on the job that sucks the life out of you. You're not dependent on the panic that seems to fuel the whole world right now. Now it's time in front of the whole world watching to use that power. Take your mattress and walk. And he did it. Let's pray. Lord, we know that you're coming back soon. We know that the day will come when you will set everything right, when all our infirmities and weakness will be gone, when all sin and darkness that has flooded the world 
through us and into us gets sucked down the drain forever. The leprous man knew it. The paralyzed man knew it. Lord, we know that you love to make your power known right now. I pray for everyone who hears this message. Let them bring their needs to you. Show your tender love and care. Bring healing, power, and forgiveness. Let us take up our mattresses and walk out of this chaos. In Jesus' name, amen.